But let me use uh, water management uh, as an example of an environmental decision-making process. Um, many counties uh, over the summer uh, put out these signs uh, to conserve water, to motivate people to conserve water. And um, what you can do, you can either turn off your sprinklers in your beautiful garden or, uh, or you can let them run. Um, if you let them run, you end up with this uh, wonderful uh, lush landscape. If you don't let them run, you end up with this, uh, this uh, scorched uh, lawn. Um, so what makes one person turn off their sprinkler and the other person uh, lets them run? Um, our graduate student had observed the following in a New York uh, state county. Uh, when the larger county sends a letter asking people to conserve water, um, there's little, uh, little compliance. When the village asks, compliance increases. So the main reason for this is probably that the increased affiliation people feel with others in their village creates um, this, this idea of like known others, whereas the county consists of unknown others. And this relates back to what uh, Dan Siegel said yesterday about these we maps. And if we can identify um, the smallest unit that people identify with, but it's big enough still to lead to some uh, action that would be important. So motivated by this anecdotal evidence, um, we designed a, a lab experiment um, to measure the effect of social goals and cooperation. In particular, we wanted to look at the effect that affiliation, that group affiliation, identifying with the smaller or the larger unit, has on cooperation. So. Um, we had four-person uh, groups in our lab, uh, similar to major greenhouse gas emitters, um, play a game where there's a financial incent incentive to defect, so it's a typical commons dilemma game structure, um, or we created different levels of group affiliation, uh, ranging from either an anonymous group, you just know that you're a member of a four-person group, you don't see these members, these members are not in your room, you just know you're part of a group. Um, then the next level would be sharing a symbol uh, and that symbol is um, um, put on your study materials, on the reading materials for this exercise, and you're a member of the yellow star group. You still don't know who the other yellow star group members are, but you have a symbol that you identify with. The next level was like creating co-presence, where the group members are in the room with you, you see them, but you cannot interact with them. You cannot talk. And the highest level of group affiliation was um, co-presence and people are allowed to interact with each other, we actually asked them to uh, do a task unrelated to the experiment, uh, such as writing a letter to the dean, they had to come up with a topic, they had to come to consensus, what are we going to write about, write a letter, and these letters were actually presented to the dean at the end of, semest of the semester. Um, so this was the highest level of uh, group affiliation. So after this little task, they then uh, engaged in the experiment, as the other groups also did. Um, so, uh, what were the results? Um, we found that as affiliation increased, so did cooperation. Um, with one exception, um, the group that interacted with each other um, on this task with the letter to the dean, if they reported later that they didn't like their group, they, uh, the group affiliation was less. But there were very few groups that actually showed, showed that sign. So, um, affiliation makes social goals or the concern for others a greater priority. And the added benefit of cooperation, more than made, made up for the sacrifice, uh, in this case money, uh, that people left on the table. So people reported later that they felt good about cooperating. Um, so in game, th game theoretical frames, um, Commons Dilemma can be transformed by social goals uh, to, pay off, to a payoff structure with multiple equilibria. And in our experiment, this worked even if the group affiliation was temporary. Uh, these students did not interact with each other before or after again. So the implications of that are, uh, if we want to promote cooperation, uh, we should try to activate social goals by integrating social and economic goals, by emphasizing, emphasizing an umbrella affiliation of players, and we need to identify what is the appropriate umbrella affiliation for a group, by targeting social goals uh, targeting social goals will also result in different decisions than when economic goals are targeted. And um, this is like insights from psychology that can combine with those of economics.
to design more effective incentive structures um, for environmental cooperation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, communication of climate change information, which is another aspect that we look at. And this is the typical slides that, um, that we put up um, when we talk about climate change, uh, the Mona Loa curve and, uh, and uh, temperature um, uh, changes over the last 1,000 years. And, um, but this does not seem to, people have not responded well to this. Um, it requires analytic processing, and, and I'm, I'm not playing the scientists. I mean, like, scientists are not trained to translate their information in ways, uh, but they're becoming more and more open and receptive and want to learn how to do this. So um, it requires analytic processing, um, often expertise, but at a, mini at a minimum interest. Um, and for a long time, we have thought, uh, we've explained uh, the lack of interest uh, or um, the lack of response uh, from the general public, we've explained that with an information deficit model. It's like, well, we have to throw more information at them. Um, that doesn't work. That isn't the right approach. Um, the reason why this information does not engage people is because uh, it does not motivate. It, it's, it, people cannot relate to it. It's too abstract. Um, it's too distant. Uh, climate change projections, people cannot wrap their minds around the year 2100, the year 2050 even, uh, or 2030, uh, it's very hard. So um, why is this? Um, well, we have two uh, information processes uh, uh, available to us, and one rational analytic system, the other one a more affective emotional system. And um, I'm not going over this uh, table um, in detail. I think um, the following slide actually explains this much better. Um, what do we respond to? Um, the scientist showing his warning curve uh, gets no attention if there's something that has of much more, if that's of a much more immediate threat. Um, so I think this gets the message across. Analytic information does not elicit fear uh, or worry or concern in people. Um, on the other side, this affective, emotional, experience-based informational clues bring out a more active response. Um, similarly, um, experience with uh, a major event such as flooding, um, most people do not have flood insurance. After a major flood, they buy insurance. In this case, it's too late the next, unless the next flood comes um, quickly thereafter. So um, personal experience is important. Um, so is second-hand experience. Um, if we let people like this uh, village chief in Alaska tell their story and how climate change is impacting their life, livelihoods, their culture, we can show people that our actions that create carbon emissions that then affect life in other parts of the world, we can create this interconnectedness and let these people speak so we can m start to map their narrative into our, into our mental models, into our map. Um, Sorry, this one wasn't. Uh, so <laughs> our research um, shows that like, utilizing this more affective, emotion-evoking material, um, uh, such as vicarious experience, scenarios, narratives, analogies, etc., cetera, um, raise attention and uh, lead to stronger engagement. And that's because the, um, the processing system that deals with this information is a stronger motivator to take action. It's, more fa it's faster, it's more automatic. And, um, and it's a wellspring of action. So that's why we should tap into it. Um, we need to translate climate change information into impacts that matter to people. Um, and in order to identify what matters to people, we need to engage with our stakeholders, with our audiences, to find out what is it that they care about. Do they care about their children? Do they care about health? Do, am I talking to farmers? What are their time scales, their time frames in which they operate, in which they can make decisions? So that we can actually come up with a tailored communication strategy for different segments of different populations. Now, if this affect processing system is so strong, and why don't we, why don't we frame all of our messages uh, like the day after tomorrow movie did? Um, well, there is, um, of course, a downside to affective and experience-based processing of information. And there's something that's called the finite pool of worry. Um, so this poor guy, there's only room for so much worry in his little pool.